recording. All right, uh, welcome back everyone after the lunch break. Our second speaker today is Jeroen joining us uh, from Auckland and he's speaking about the geometries of the Freudentartin's magic square. Go Jeroen. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And it's actually uh, almost day to day, two years ago that I was in uh, Newcastle in person. And shortly afterwards, our borders were closed. Um, I hope to be there in person again soon. So the goal of the talk today is to give you a bit of an overview of a, a long-term program that I have been involved in um, starting in 2010 with Hendrik van Mulgen, and then later joined uh, with his PhD students, Anlein de Schepper and Magali Victor. And so um, it's quite a lot of content, so I will not put too much emphasis on detail, but try to give you a, a sort of a, an idea of what we're trying to, to do. And I will start with a little bit of historic uh, context, so where this research sort of fits in. And I'll go back to 1872, when Felix uh, Klein um, proposed to study geometries by means of their symmetries in his uh, Erlanger program. So he, his idea was that if you want to understand geometries better, you should have a look at their symmetries and they will inform you then about the geometry. And around the same time, uh, Sophus Lee developed Lee groups as a natural model for continuous symmetry. So he said, if you want to study things like uh, rotations and more general continuous symmetry, uh, we'll do that in the form of a group later named uh, a Lee group. Uh, and this was over the real and complex numbers. Uh, and then in the first half, uh, well, first half and the later second half of the 20th century, uh, André Vey, uh, Claude Chevalet, and then later uh, Armand Borel and Jacques Titz, they abstracted these Lie groups to arbitrary fields. So they put the theory on a more um, algebraic uh, footing. Uh, and a lot of this uh, information is captured by um, root systems, which are expressed by dinking diagrams. Uh, and that's how you can study the Lie algebras. So the Lie algebras are sort of linearized objects which you can associate to an algebraic group that gives you a lot of information. And so in the 1950s, uh, Jacques Titz proposed a sort of a converse to the Erlanger program. So remember Klein said, well, geometries, we want to uh, study them by means of their symmetries or groups. So Titz said, well, the other way around, if we want to study groups, what we're going to do is we're going to associate geometries to these groups called buildings. And then we will understand these groups better through their actions on these geometric objects. So it's a sort of a reverse uh, to the Erlanger program. Um, so this historic context will not be particularly relevant for the rest of the talk, but just to uh, start somewhere. And in the talk today, I will focus uh, on this program with Van Aldegem, which is a, a geometric study of uh, spherical buildings, and in particular, uh, exceptional spherical buildings. So the, the spherical buildings are the easiest to understand uh, amongst the buildings and are related to classical geometries. So here is our uh, protagonist, Jacques Titz, who unfortunately passed away uh, not so long ago. This is him uh, in 57 on the Carpathia on the way to the US, uh, if my sources are correct. Um, so here is the Freudenthal Titz uh, magic square. So that's the object uh, of study. And so the goal of the talk today is to explain to you a little bit more what this, um, what these diagrams uh, mean. So um, you see there, I have uh, an A and a B, which index uh, some composition algebras. So the, um, in the left column, I have K, L, H, and O. You should think K is a field. L is the quadratic extension over K, H stands for a quaternion over K, and O stands for the octonions. And so Freudenthal and Titz in the mid 60s, um, they had a recipe, which starting from two such composition algebras, they constructed with a complicated formula, uh, a Lie algebra. And in particular, you get the exceptional Lie algebras. And so what you see in this uh, diagram are um, corresponding 
uh, geometries. So we will look at this square from a geometric point of view. And this is closer um, to an original description by Jacques Titz in his habilitation in 1955, where he gave a description of the first uh, three rows and had some conjectural predictions about the fourth row. So I say you see exceptional ones. Well, you see if you recognize the beacon diagrams, for instance, in the bottom right corner here, you see E8. So the goal of our project is to study these geometries. Uh, and I will spend a lot of time on the second row, the green one here. I will try to explain to you in detail what happens there. But before I do that, uh, I need to like talk a little bit about the connections uh, between the rows. So as you can see, um, there is some sort of a residual property going on. Namely, if you look at the bottom row and you look at the rightmost uh, vertex in the entries, if you rem remove that, then you get the, uh, the picture in the row above. See, so for instance, in E8, off, you get the geometry in the row above. And you can repeat that. If in this row, um, you chop this off, then you go to the second row. Uh, the first row is a little bit special uh, and corresponds to taking a hyperplane intersection. I will not spend too much time on that. But the second, third, and fourth row are connected um, via this residual property. And you, think, you should think of that as looking at the tangent space in a point. If you want to think classically, geometrically, you would have a projective variety here. And then you would look at the tangent variety at that point, you would see the corresponding variety in the row above. So that's an important ingredient in our approach to the square is that there is some geometric uh, induction going on between the rows. And then a second thing, uh, which I will probably not spend time on today, is that there's uh, also a connection between the columns, because as I said, we will associate uh, projective varieties uh, to these buildings. And you should view these A and these B entries as some sort of coordinatization. So that means that if in the fourth column, I have something uh, coordinatized over the octonians, then by restriction, I will see something coordinatized over the quaternions, something over a quadratic extension and over the field itself. So there's uh, columns going from right to left is restriction of your algebraic structure and the rows is like taking re residues. So unsurprisingly, uh, if you understand uh, the thing in the bottom right hand corner, E8, then you understand all the rest. But our approach is different. We are trying to understand the easier parts first and then build up uh, towards E8. So that's sort of the, the goal of the project. Um, as you can see, I have 35 slides. Probably I have too many, but uh, I'll just see where I, where I get to. Okay. So as I said, you get projective varieties from these abstract geometries. I will try to explain uh, in a couple of slides how one does that. Uh, and in the split case, fourth row, these are called the adjoint varieties because they're closely related to the so-called adjoint uh, Lie algebra. Uh, as I said, if you take a point residue, then you get a variety uh, in the row above. So from the Freudenthal varieties in the fourth row, you get the Legendre varieties in the third row. And then you go to the Severi varieties in the second row. And the first row is a little bit special. It corresponds to this hyperplane intersection. Uh, for those that know, there is something called the 27-dimensional E6 module. And if you intersect that with a hyperplane, you get a 26 dimensional F4 module. That's what you see in the first uh, row. Okay. Um, so the first thing we need to do is um, we want to get these varieties and we are starting with buildings and we're gonna go from the buildings to the varieties in two steps. So the first step is that starting from a building, we're gonna uh, construct a point line geometry which is easier uh, to understand perhaps than the abstract building. And then the second step will be to embed this point line geometry in a projective space. And that will give us the variety. 
So I will explain the procedure uh, here, uh, and then I'll give an example, which will hopefully uh, clarify it. So if you have a spherical building of rank N, you have a typeset, um, and you take a subset of the typeset called J, you can associate a Lie instance geometry, so gamma, this notation PL stands for the fact that it's a point line geometry. So you're going to have a, a set of points and then a set of subsets of these points, which you call lines. And then you're going to declare incidences when a point belongs to a line, etc. And for us here, point sets will be sets of flags of delta of type J. So this slide is if you already know uh, all these things. On the next slide, it will be uh, an example will be e easier to understand. And the set of lines uh, correspond to the set of flags where you have to exclude um, an element in J. Uh, and then you look at the set of flags of type J such that if you uh, take the union of F with uh, such a flag F prime, you get a chain there. So easy example, if delta has type AN, so that's just a Coxter uh, diagram, which is just uh, uh, all, uh, it's simply laced, so just, uh, a string apart and if j is one that means you circle the first uh, node then you get the normal point line geometry of a projective space so an buildings of type an correspond to, to the projective spaces uh, and if you circle the first node you get the normal uh, geometry of the projective space so in our program we also use the theory of diagram geometries to study buildings but that will not feature uh, heavily today. So here's an example uh, where instead of the first note, I take the second note. So again, I have uh, this is a, A3, and now this black dot means that I have taken J to be the middle vertex. So not the first one, but the middle one. Uh, and so it comes from a projective space over a skew field. And I will now associate uh, a geometry, a point line geometry. So here, um, if you will not be confused, then I congratulate you because there will be uh, points and in red and points not in red and they are different. So I'll try not to confuse myself for starters. Uh, and I've helped uh, by putting the one types in red and the other ones in black. If, yeah, if you're color blind, it will not help you. But uh, so the points of the geometry are the lines of the projective space. So we declare uh, our point set to be the lines of the original uh, three-dimensional space. And as I said, uh, you want it to be a point line geometry. So I need to say what the lines are. The lines will be incident point plane pairs. So you can read this off from the diagram. Namely, if you look at the black dot, then originally the dot on the left most hand side were the points of the projective space. These were the lines of the projective space and these were the planes of the projective space. So now here, the residue of a point, it has two things, both points and planes. So these are incident point plane pairs. So what I'm explaining to you is a line Grassmannian. The planes of G are of two types. Indeed, if you look at this point on the, le on the left-hand side, what remains is an A2. It's a projective uh, plane. But, and if you look at this one, and you see what remains, it's also a projective plane, uh, plane. So you get two types of planes in this new geometry, which are the old points and the old planes. And then you need to declare an incidence. So we need to say when a point and a line in this new geometry are incident. So remember, a point in the new geometry is a line in the old one. So if the line in the old geometry belongs to the plane pencil determined by the point and the plane, so if you have an incident point plane pair, you have a point in a plane, and then you can look at all the lines through that point. And if the line in the projective space you started from is one of those lines, then you say they are incident. And then we need to say when a line and a plane are incident. So a line here is an incident point plane pair, and the planes are either points and planes. Well, the natural thing to do is to say that they are incident if the point or the plane is one of the elements of that incident pair. And then finally, um, a point and a plane. So that's either a line with a point or a line with a plane. 
they are incident if they were incident before. Um, I hope this helps, but yeah, it is, it is confusing that it's the same, but I didn't want to invent other names because I think that would not have helped either. So this is sort of the first step, how you com come from a, a diagram like this, how you construct the point line geometry out of it. Uh, and then the next step is to embed it. Uh, and that's, um, here is an example of an embedding of the line Grassmannian on the previous slide is the Klein quadric. So how do you do that? Well, um, remember our points were these lines in the projective space. And now I'm gonna associate uh, a point in a projective five space. So I'm gonna embed this abstract geometry into a projective space of a higher dimension. So how do I do that? I take a line in the three-dimensional space and I pick two points on that line with projective coordinates x0 up to x3 and y equal to y0 up to y3. And then I map uh, x, y uh, to the point in P5k with coordinates uh, P, i, j. These are the so-called Plucker coordinates. So it's just x, i, y, j minus y, i, x, j. Of course, you might now protest and say, well, you have chosen two points. What if you choose two other points? Well, if I choose two other points, I will get uh, the same coordinates up to a scalar multiple, but everything is projective, so it's all fine. So it gives me a well-defined map from lines in three space to points in five space. And you can verify that uh, you satisfy a so-called Plucker relation. So if you look at these expressions, you can combine them into this equation. So this gives you uh, a quadric in five dimensions. And so the abstract geometry I described on the previous slide has a concrete embedding into a projective space. And so it's these sorts of embeddings uh, that we study in our projects. Any questions so far? Okay, good. Uh, and here, this is again a technical slide. I won't dwell on it too much. Um, this is just abstractly setting up what it means to embed uh, such a point line geometry into a projective space. So you just say that, well, what are you going to do? You have to make sure that what you call the points in your abstract geometry are the points in your projective space. And you need to make sure that what you call your lines in your abstract geometry map onto lines in your projective geometry. And then the rest of the slide uh, is a little bit of explanation of um, you might imagine that the same abstract geometry might have different embeddings uh, in projective space, maybe one in dimension seven, maybe another one in dimension 20, who knows. Uh, and you could naturally wonder whether there is like an overarching object, uh, so some sort of universal embedding of which all the other ones are quotients or projections. And that's called the absolute universal embedding. And it turns out for the uh, geometries that we study that they typically tend to have an absolutely universal embedding. And then that's important to know because um, if we want to pinpoint which variety we're looking at, we need to know uh, whether we're looking at the absolute universal embedding or not. Okay, um, here's a concrete theorem. So I'm now going to come uh, to the geometries of the second uh, row. So th that was the one in green. I should uh, maybe go back and show you them. So these were these ones, these, these four. I'm now going to talk about these four. And these are called the severity varieties. So um, algebraic description of the severity varieties. So the first one is the Veronese variety. So this is a mapping from a projective two space. So as I just uh, showed to you in my square, you saw that I had a dinking diagram of type A2. So that's a projective plane. And I look at a map which maps uh, the point with coordinate x, y, z to the point with coordinates x square, x, y, x, z, y square, y, z, z square. And that will be the projective variety corresponding to that entry in the square. You might say, well, how did you know that? Uh, it is because we know that the fourth row have to be the adjoint varieties. And we know that then you should obtain the others through um, taking these residues. 
The second entry, that was a product of two projective planes. Um, and you obtain the Sager variety, which is take two points with these respective coordinates and map them to their uh, products. So you get three times three is nine coordinates. So you end up in the eight dimensional projective space. Um, the fourth entry are line grass manians. So let me go back uh, once again. So you could see here, this was A2 cross A2 for Sagra. So these uh, springs that I have here means that I have taken some sort of product. And for the third row, the fact that these two dots were blackened, the fact that I blackened this dot means that I declare these to be the points. And this here, that will be correspond to the quadrix. So I see this Klein quadrix that I discussed uh, a minute ago. And that's the line Grassmannian. And the fourth one is a so-called Cartan variety. Okay, and that has a more complicated algebraic description uh, linked to this E6 module that I talked about. Anyway, the details are not so important. What is important is you get these four varieties and they are seemingly quite different. Right? I think you, you would agree that you cannot see an immediate connection uh, between them. And the beauty will be that they are actually intimately uh, connected. And I'll have to start with um, Severi's theorem. So that's a theorem from uh, 1901. And this is why these varieties are called uh, Severi varieties. So it turns out that this uh, quadric Veronese variety, that this is uh, quite special. Uh, namely, if you look at surfaces in P5C, which uh, satisfy a number of uh, adjectives. So um, non-degenerate, it needs to span the entire five-dimensional space, irreducible in the sense of Zariski topology, uh, smooth uh, with respect to the Jacobian criterion. That's all fine and well. The most important property is the fact that you want these surfaces to be uh, secant defective. What does that mean? Um, it means that if you construct the secant variety, that is, you take the Zariski closure of the union of whenever you take two different points, you take uh, the secant line through them. And if you have taken the same point, you take the tangent line. If this uh, variety is not everything, then, um, then you call it secant defective. So typically for a variety, it, you will get everything in this way. Another way of expressing this is secant defective means that there exists a point from which you can isomorphically project your variety. If you don't get everything like this, then there is a point that is not there. And then from that point, you can project without losing information. So typically you cannot do that. And typically it's expressed here in the theorem by Severi. If you see such a surface in P5C, then you are looking at the quadric Veronese variety. There are no others. Uh, how would you see that the uh, quadric Veronese variety is sick and defective? Uh, that's an easy proof. Uh, what do you do? Uh, let's look at the corner description again. Uh, I just need to be uh, here. Look at the corner description. Um, associate uh, a matrix to this, a three by three matrix where you put the quadratic terms on the diagonal, so x square, y square, z square, and then you put the cross product terms uh, on the logical positions of the diagonal. So x, y in the first row, second column, and in the second row, first column, and similarly for the two other ones. Now, um, sorry, I'm struggling with my, it jumps everywhere. <laughs> um, it's not hard to see that this gives you a matrix of rank one, because look, for instance, at, at the top two by two matrix, it is a two by two matrix, which entries X squared, X, Y, X, Y, Y squared. So it's determined is zero. So these are, you get rank one matrices. Now, if you take a secant, a secant corresponds to taking two such matrices. And so by sub additivity of rank, you will span something of rank at most two. So that means that this, uh, secant variety that you get in this way, all the things in there will satisfy that their determinant is zero. 
So therefore you won't get everything. So this is a quick proof why this uh, quadric Vernis variety is secant defective. Of course, uh, the power of the theorem is that there are no others. Um, and they'll prove the characteristic P version uh, of this theorem in 1985. Now, uh, Zach, I'll tell you in a second what this has to do with our project. First, uh, I will discuss uh, Zach's theorem. So Zach uh, generalized uh, Severis theorem uh, to the Severi varieties, so to all four of those. So he takes um, same adjectives, but now you take dimension D, uh, and he still wants it to be uh, an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. So you can think complex numbers. And he proves that if X is secant effective, then uh, N, that's the dimension in which you embed, needs to have a minimum threshold of three over two times D uh, plus two. Okay. Um, and I uh, if equality occurs, then X is either uh, the Veronese variety, uh, when D is one, I should have said uh, three times D here, sorry, um, not three and a half. Uh, or it's the Sigurd variety for D is two, or it's the Lang Grassmannian, or it's the Cartan variety. So this is very nice because it um, unites these four seemingly different varieties. And as I said, this has a long history going back to Severi in 1901, and then Skorza, uh, in 1908, uh, but his proof uh, was not entirely convincing, as many proofs in, from that school in that day. Uh, and that was conjectured. So that's sort of funny because it was conjectured almost 71 years after it was supposedly proved by Griffiths and Harris and Fujita and Roberts. Uh, and so Zach's theorem uh, will follow from the split case of our theorem for the second uh, row. Um, in the case of an algebraic closed field of characteristic zero. However, we have not generalized Zach's theorem to arbitrary fields in the sense of this secant defectivity. So that we don't know. So now I'll come to the uh, axiomatic uh, setup. So how we look at these varieties. So we have a combinatorial uh, framework to study them. So we look at X, um, a point set spanning the projective space. Um, well, let's for simplicity not allow infinite dimensional, otherwise I'll have to make too many exceptions. Well, not too many, but here and there I have to say something. Uh, and then sigma is a collection of D plus one dimensional subspaces, such that in these subspaces, I see a non-degenerate quadric or an ovoid. I'll tell you a little bit later what an ovoid is, but you can have in mind that I see things like the Klein quadric, for instance. So I have a, a bunch of points and a whole bunch of quadrics. Uh, and now we're going to set up what we mean by an axiomatic uh, Veronese variety. So we want uh, that for any pair of points, there is at least one quadric uh, that contains them. Then the second condition is um, if you have two spaces which contain these quadrics, so these quadrics, for instance, live in a five-dimensional projective space. If you intersect two of these, then you want the intersection to be entirely contained in the point set. So we are not asking that they have to intersect, but if they do intersect, then they must intersect in points belonging to the point set. And then the, sec the third condition is that we want there to be an upper bound on the dimension of the tangent space. So... Um, Think about, for instance, the, the actual uh, axiomatic Vernet's variety. Suppose that all these quadrics are conics. Then if you look at a point, such a point has a whole bunch of conics uh, through it. And each of these conics uh, has a tangent line. And a priori, it could be that these tangent uh, lines span a very big dimensional space. But we want to bound this by 2D. So that's our axiomatic uh, setup uh, for the second row. And we can prove um, that if you have a, such an AVV, uh, abstract Veronese variety of type D in P and K. So the reason, by the way, that I uh, chose this a parameter to be D plus one 
is because I want D to be one, two, four, and eight in the end, because that's that are the numbers that correspond to quaternions, octonions, etc. So we prove that if you have an abstract Veronese variety of type D, it's projectively equivalent to one of the following. So either it's uh, you see the four uh, severe varieties, but we get one more, which is the half spin variety in a 15 dimensional projective space. And then I will discuss these ones later. So these ones have to do when I get uh, ovoids. So here, these varieties, these are related to quadrics of so-called maximal uh, width index. These are quadrics which have uh, the highest possible uh, dimensional subspaces on them. Uh, these ones will be on the opposite side of the spectrum. But so we, we can prove this theorem. And as I said, uh, in the case of uh, algebraically close of characteristic zero, we can recover uh, Zach's uh, theorem. And so this uh, is partly joined with Anneline de Schepper uh, and uh, Oliver uh, Krauss. Okay, proof ideas in the split case. Um, yeah, the split case is 100 pages in total. So, and I have two slides about it. So I will not be able to, uh, to do it justice, but I will try nevertheless. So I will try to explain to you um, how we use an inductive procedure. And so I have sketched, uh, sketched here uh, E6. Um, and so E6, and I have declared the first dot to be the points. You remember in my slides, uh, my colorful slide there, this E6 had two circles. And so this means I declare this to be the points. And then uh, this object, if you want to know what this object is, you need to um, put your hand on it and see what remains. And what remains is a diagram of type uh, D5. And this corresponds to a uh, hyperbolic quadric. So that's something that satisfies a relation similar to the Plucker relation that I showed you but in higher dimension. Now, um, how do we recognize this variety? Well, our approach is inductive. So the idea is that if we were able to know what um, all the tangent varieties are in every single point, then you can imagine that you might be able to reconstruct uh, the, the global variety. So that's what the theory of diagram geometries tells you. If you if you know a lot of local things, then you know what globally is happening. So let's look at the point residue here. If I want to take the point residue, it means that I uh, remove this dot. I see what remains and I declare the next node next to this one to be the points. So that's taking a residue. So this one, uh, it's D5, but the points are on the on the wrong side with the normal d5 the points would be here because the points are on this side that's why it's called half spin d5 and this was one of the ones uh, that occurred in my theorem on the previous slide but the idea of the proof is that we will have determined what half spin d5 uh, which variety you get before and then because we will see this everywhere we will be able to say what the e6 one is and a similar procedure will have been used to recognize the D5. So if you look at the D5, you would take a residue again, and you would what would you get? Look at what remains. So I told you, you remove this one, and you would put a note here. This diagram is an A4, and I would have circled the second uh, node, which would mean that I would be looking at a line Grassmannian of type A4 which is the analogon of the line Grassmannian of type A3, which gave me the Klein quadric, which I explained to you before. Okay, So that's sort of the idea. And this line Grassmannian A4 will have been characterized before, et cetera, et cetera. And so at some point, the varieties become so simple that you can recognize them, and then you build them up uh, from bottom to top. OK. Um, but of course, this inductive procedure, I mean, how do, what do I need to do? I need to look at these axioms. Uh, if I want to do inductions, then these axioms need to be well suited uh, for induction. It's not hard to prove uh, mm -hmm. that the first two axioms uh, work well with induction. 
Um, namely, if you look at the residue at a point and you had two big quadrics before and they only intersected in stuff uh, in X, then in the residue that, that can't go wrong. The hard part is this axiom. So this is restricting the dimension of the tangent space in a point. Uh, and a priori, there is no reason for this to sufficiently diminish. So if you take a residue, you're going to go from D to D minus 2, which means that you, will, you need to be able to let your dimension of your tangent space drop by 4. And that's quite hard uh, to prove. Uh, I'll give you an idea here how you can make it drop for E6. So E6 uh, corresponds uh, to D equals to 8. Remember, that's the case D equal to 8. We have this abstract variety. And so our axiom says that the dimension of the tangent space is at most 16. OK, at most 16, great. So then take the residue in a point. If you take the residue uh, and you look at what remains after projection, this dimension will drop by 1. So it was at most 16 before. So the dimension of the residue will be at most uh, 15. So yeah, this is the residue of the so residue of the tangent space. Okay, and what I need to do is I need to look at the points in this residue x, and my goal is to uh, bound to the dimension of the tangent space of this x. Now, the quadrix for E six or what we think is going to be E six, are hyperbolic quadrics in nine dimensions. So their residue will be hyperbolic quadrics in seven dimensions. So Q plus seven Q. And the way we do this is you look at the tangent space through X now, and you look at how big the intersection can be with this uh, hyperbolic quadric. Now the largest dimensional subspaces on such a quadric are three dimensional. And we can prove that um, whatever is in the intersection needs to be a subspace that is contained in here. That's quite hard to do, but we can do that. So once you believe that, then it's easy, because then I can just use the Grassmann dimension formula. The dimension of the space in total is at most 15. And I know that I have a tangent space here. I add the 7 from here, and I only need to subtract the dimension of the intersection but the dimension of the intersection is at most three. So the dimension of the tangent space here will be at most 11. And remember what the goal was. The goal was to go from uh, 16 to at most uh, 12. So we even have one to spare here. Uh, and we can inductively build up like that. OK. Um, if you got lost a little bit, uh, it's time to get back on track because I'm shifting uh, gears uh, and I'm looking at uh, Tits, Tits's original uh, magic square, which is showing a little bit better where these um, algebras come from. So uh, he has here uh, four rows, although he originally only had three rows, as I told you. And basically you have diagrams here of type a1, A2, C3, and F4. Uh, and it turns out that you can equip these, um, you can coordinateize over certain algebraic structures. And so the first column is what you get when you just coordinateize over the field itself. And then if you move um, to the right, you start to have coordinate structures which are bigger. And here you can see again this idea that I told you in the beginning that if you want to go from right to left, it's restricting things. If you look at E8, well, not F4 here with O, O, and K, K, if I restrict to the quaternions, I get this one. If I restrict to quadratic extension, I get that one. So the, here you can clearly see this algebraic idea of restriction. So um, it's uh looked and he saw that you could you could do this so now a natural question is well but what does this uh square have to do with that colored square in the beginning because here these diagrams look very very different from the diagrams in the beginning except for the ones 
in the first row, which are the same ones. So the, the fact that the first row are the same ones, that's because we were working with the fields here. But if we look at these ones, some sort of uh, complexification takes place where you um, simplify the algebraic structure, but then your diagram becomes more complicated. So I'll try to give you an idea of what that is. Oh, sorry, I always click. So the complexification of a Lie algebra, that's obtained by tensoring. So if you have a, a real Lie algebra, you can uh, tensor it with the complex numbers and get a complex uh, Lie algebra. Uh, and conversely, if you have a complex Lie algebra, you can look at the fixed point set of some automorphism, and then you get a so-called real form. Uh, to give an analogy, uh, if you have, for instance, uh, if you have an equation over the complex numbers, if you have uh, equations, you can always write it into their uh, real um, and imaginary part and you get twice as many equations. So you have um, some sort of connection there. And the real forms have to do with uh, coordinate transformation. So if I take, for instance, uh, x0, x1 uh, equal to 0 over the complexes, and now I restrict to the reals, I get x0, x1 equal to 0. But now I could do a, a coordinate transformation like uh, x0 plus ix1, x0 minus ix1. And then I get a different equation. And then if I restrict, I get something different. You see, that's like what, these real forms. And what Titz did is he introduced a complexification uh, on the geometric side, uh, which is a little bit hard to describe. But to make a long story short, this is how you get from uh, these diagrams, my, my more complicated diagrams in the beginning, is when you do this geometric complexification uh, procedure. For instance, if you take the projective plane over the octonians and you complexify it, you get E6 over C. So, um, I mean, that, that needs work, of course, to prove this, but that's the connection between um, these two things. And this is related to the ditches indices of algebraic groups for those uh, who know that. I'll have a look. As I said, I, <laughs> I have way too much. So I'll just keep, um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep going, mainly talking about the se second row. So I discussed the theorem of the second row uh, and I talked to you about um, these severe varieties. And I said that these are um, related to split quadrics, which are quadrics which have the highest possible uh, dimensions uh, contained in them as flats. On the opposite, uh, opposite side of the spectrum, you have the, the so-called ovoids. So ovoids are, um, there are no lines in an ovoid. Uh, so you can think of a, a ball in three dimensions. So this, this is the very opposite side of the spectrum. So the ones had, for instance, I don't know, five dimensional spaces or the biggest ones you can have. These ones don't even have lines on them. So here uh, we will need a different uh, approach. So uh, an ovoid, what is it? No line intersected in more than two points. And there is a unique hyperplane at every point. So that's true, for instance, in a circle or a ball. And this hyperplane is called the tangent uh, hyperplane at x and denoted by TXO. And so I'll repeat my axioms here, but uh, adapted for the, the special case uh, of these ovoids. So any two points lie in a unique element of uh, Xi. So for instance, if my uh, ovoids uh, are conics, any two elements lie in a conic. Uh, if I intersect two planes which contain a conic, then they intersect in a point of the point set. And then um, this is the equivalent of saying that um, you want your tangent space to be at most um, 2D dimensional. But so you can here think of just as dimension Tx is at most 2D. But I have written it here like this to allow infinite dimensionality, but I, I won't dwell on that. But so this is a repetition of my axioms. And then it turns out that these are intimately related uh, to the quadratic alternative division algebras. So this is now the non-split case. 
The non-split case is related uh, to the version of TITS, which I showed you two slides ago. And so what are quadratic alternative division algebras? Well, it are the ones that I have already showed uh, to you. So the first four are in dimension one, two, four, and eight. Uh, and then there is like a special case, uh, which is uh, purely inseparable extensions, but that, yeah, we, we will not worry about them. Uh, is just to say that this list of four is not exhaustive, but if you're not interested in characteristic two, then you can just uh, forget about the last case. So this is kind of interesting because look at this. There are no, uh, <laughs> no algebras to be seen here whatsoever. So somehow we will need to uh, have a recipe that somehow at some point these quaternions and octonions uh, will appear. This may seem a little bit uh, mysterious. Um, so I'll give some examples that satisfy these uh, axioms in this case. And these are called uh, Veronesian caps. And these are um, called Veronesian caps because they are um, generalizations of the Veronese variety. So what do we do? Um, we take a field K and we have some uh, involution for which uh, both the trace and the norm uh, of an element belong to the field. And these elements satisfy a quadratic equation. Uh, X squared minus A plus A sigma X plus A sigma A is zero. So you could have in mind, um, as an easy example, you take the reals you, uh, as K, you take the complex uh, numbers as A, and you take sigma to be complex conjugation then it's true that uh, a number plus its conjugate is two times the real part and a number times its conjugate is the modulus squared. And you can check that this equation is fulfilled. Um, so for quaternions and octonions, you have a similar thing. So now I'm gonna cook up uh, point sets in projective space as follows. I take three copies of K and three copies of A and then I declare these to be the point sets. So what happens if I take um, the easiest of easiest of examples, namely I take A to be equal to K and I take Sigma to be the identity. Then I get here in the last line, X squared, Y squared one, Y, X, X, Y. And so if you uh, homogenize this, you get X square, Y square, Z square, Y, Z, X, Z, X, Y, which is the Veronese variety. So that's what I meant when I said it's a generalization of the Veronese variety. But if you take A to be, for instance, a uh, octonian algebra, then this is eight uh, dimensional. And so this vector space is then 27 dimensional. And so you end up in 26 dimensional projective space. Okay, so these are examples of Veronesean caps. So satisfying these exact uh, axioms on the previous slide. And so the, the point is that these are the only examples in the split case. And then what we showed with um, Annalene later is that if you take, uh, I discussed now when they have maximal width index. Now I discuss when they have minimal width index. And with Annalene in a long and technical paper, we proved that no examples arise if you allow any other, uh, anything in between or if you take them to be of different, like no other examples can occur. That's um, long and difficult. Okay, um, so proof ideas, I will not spend too much time on this. I just want to give you a hint where these um, algebras uh, come from. So we first um, project from one of these fixed ovoids and we show that we get a projective plane structure in this way. That's great. So the idea of the proof is that Projective planes, if you equip a projective plane with nicer and nicer properties, then the algebra over which they are coordinatized is more and more determined. That's, uh, for instance, if the Pappus configuration holds, then it must be a field. If the Zar configuration holds, it must be a skew field. And there are weaker forms of this. And one of these is uh, to show that um, we show that it's a MUFANG plane with the Andre Brock Bose construction, for those that know what that is. So a MUFANG plane is a plane that still has a lot of symmetry. 
And so uh, they are coordinated by so-called alternative division algebras, of which we saw examples um, a couple of slides ago. But these examples were also quadratic. So the first step is to show that we get MUFAN. So we get some handle on the algebra, alternative division algebra. But then uh, I showed you this equation, x squared minus trace x plus norm is 0. So you somehow need to show that every element is quadratic over its center. You need to do that in a geometric way. And you do that by constructing subcaps. Uh, and these subcaps of dimension 2, that's a, a true tour de force by, by Hendrik to get that. Uh, and then once you have this, if we have it's an alternative division algebra and it's quadratic, then we have seen the classification there, which was uh, field, quadratic extension, quaternion, octonion, and these uh, strange examples in characteristic two. Then the last step of the proof is to show projective equivalence with the above examples. Um, oh, uh, I missed it. I'm almost out of time, so I'll, um, I'll wrap up quickly. So this is my good friend, uh, Ernie Schult. And Ernie was a specialist in uh, abstract uh, geometries. And part of our um, project is to use these abstract geometries to characterize uh, the third row and the fourth row, because so far I've only spoken about the second row to you. So we need some uh, results on abstract geometries to make progress on these other uh, rows. Um, and so classical polar spaces, these are the ones that come from quadratic forms. So I gave you the Klein quadric, but there are other ones related to symplectic uh, groups and unitary groups. And they can be axiomatized. So this is uh, Buchenwald and Schult found a way of describing these, quadrat uh, these algebraic objects in a purely uh, geometric way. So if you have a geometry satisfying these kinds of conditions, it is a polar space. Um, OK, let me cut to the chase. So we have a whole bunch of uh, abstract geometries which you characterize. But I want to conclude by talking about uh, the results for the third row, um, which I will describe very briefly. So I told you the severe varieties, uh, they have nice uh, algebraic expressions, and we had an axiomatic setup uh, to characterize them. Now it turns out that the varieties in the third row um, also uh, have nice algebraic descriptions. So for instance, the first column is the Sager variety. So that's a, a product of three projective lines. And then there are more complicated uh, entries uh, for the second, third, and fourth column. And what we can show is that um, we define a so-called abstract uh, Lagrangian variety, which is something similar to the abstract Veronese variety we saw with very closely related axioms. And we can again show that the only ones that you obtain are uh, the ones in the square or closely related to the square. And so of particular note, is the exceptional variety E7 in 55 dimensional projective space. So that's a, a well studied variety. And this one shows up and it's related to E7. Okay, this is long paper. Uh, and as part of the paper, we also construct uh, these geometries. And so I'll conclude with that. So in the third row, and that's uh, joint work with Hendrik and Annalene and, and Magali. Uh, we construct these varieties uh, ourselves, both as the as what we call as a risky closure, and we also have a combinatorial construction uh, based on some very interesting graphs. And we can obtain E seven as an intersection of one hundred and twenty nine quadrics uh, over an arbitrary field. So, what else is there to do? Uh, a lot, because yeah, in twelve years' time, we only managed to do the second and the third row. Uh, so there's still some things to do. Uh, the first row, as I said, is a little bit uh, strange because it's an intersection. So we have like left that one aside for the moment because we want to uh, build up. And for the fourth row, constructions are unknown. 
like good easy constructions are unknown and so the holy grail of our project would be uh, to resolve an old problem of finding an explicit geometric description of a module whose symmetries are e8 and with explicit i mean um, a bit like the ones that i have shown you like with a, a nice uh, description of the coordinates yeah that's it uh, as i expected uh, i had way too much but i still hope you enjoyed it thank you Thank you very much, Jeroen, for that exceptional talk. Um, do we have any questions or comments? Jeroen, uh, do you have ideas for your holy grail? Is there any uh, guess where to start, or is it still completely open? Um, we have some ideas for constructions, but mainly for the first entry. Um, no, nothing too concrete yet. Not as concrete as I put in my grant proposal, at least. <laughs> so who, who buys this 125-year-old rock? Um, well, it's people started giving the descriptions of the other ones. I'm not sure if it's explicitly stated as a as a very old problem, but they give uh, descriptions of all the other ones. So I assumed uh, they were trying this one as well. Yeah. But to go back to James's question, so the idea, like, do we have any ideas? Well, the idea would be to reduce it uh, to the third row, but there's a, a major <clears throat> obstruction uh, this time because, uh, well, it will sound silly because it's the difference between two very finite numbers. When we went uh, from the third row to the second, uh, in the second row, you saw that uh, the dimension of the tangent space had to diminish by four to apply this induction. Essentially, when you go from the, the uh, third row to the second row, you have to be able to make the dimension diminish by D. And from the fourth row, it has to be diminished by way more. So we'll probably need some, some new idea. The key tool is probably, um, the thing which I did not discuss, which are these uh, abstract lacunary parapolar spaces by Schultz. So that's a very broad abstract class of geometries uh, where we have obtained uh, a classification result. So I'll, I'll just, I won't dwell on it. But these are uh, abstract geometries where some intersection dimensions are missing. And as you can see from this table, you get very interesting geometries in the conclusions. And these are the same sort of geometries you want to get in the conclusions for the magic square. So one possible approach would be to try and reduce it until we can show that we get a, such a lacunary parapolar space, but we, we don't know how to do that for the moment. Anyone else? Anyone online? All right, if that's not the case, then we thank you again. And we can stop the recording there. And we'll have a 30-minute coffee break, I believe.